Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone here to the first, um, this is the first of our School of Classics research seminars for the new academic year. It's also our annual lecture for the Center for Ancient Environmental Studies. Um, we've also, it's also the culmination of a day of um, research papers. We've been having a, a research in, in progress workshop through the day on trees, deforestation, epic in, in Greek and Roman antiquity, many other things, um, which has been a lot of fun. Um, I need to acknowledge generous support from the Royal Society of Edinburgh funding the, the, the um, one-day event through their research network grant scheme and also um, support in all sorts of ways from the School of Classics, especially to our fantastic administrators. Most importantly, uh, uh, I am very pleased to welcome uh, Edith Hall from Durham here today. Um, uh, I'd need 10 tongues, 10 mouths to describe all of Edith's achievements and all of her publications. Uh, I won't list them all here, we'd be here for a long time. She's written more, published more than 30 books on ancient Greek literature, various aspects of um, classical reception. Um, initially, most of you, many of you will know this already, but initially a lot of Edith's work was on focus on uh, uh, ancient drama, especially tragedy. Um, he might, many of you will know Edith's 1989 book, Inventing the Barbarian, which is still gets a huge amount of um, uh, borrows from our university library. It's a, a very, very heavily used book in a, for our undergraduates and beyond still. Um, Edith's worked on East Coast Persians, Euripides, Iphigenia and Taurus, and its reception history. Um, but more recently, she's broadened out to look at more and more um, widely at the whole, really, the whole sweep of classical Greek literature and its reception. I'll just give you a few highlights. Her 2008 book, The Return of Ulysses, A Cultural History of Homer's Odyssey. 2018 book, Aristotle's Way, which I guess is feeding into Edith's current um, ERC-funded project on uh, Aristotle at Durham. Um, 2021, uh, Tony Harrison's Classicism, really important work, a uh, uh, um, milestone in classical reception studies. And I think a special mention to uh, 2020, uh, publication jointly with our colleague Henry Stead, who's not not here today, but um, here in spirit, I think, um, A People's History of Classics, Class and Greco-Roman Antiquity in Britain, 1689 to 1939. Um, uh, a small subject, as you can see. Um, and there's also, on top of that, a huge range of other achievements, important edited volumes, not least, which I won't go through here. But more recently, Edith has been working on, um, uh, I guess, ecological approaches to um, Homer's Iliad, and that's what we are going to hear today. That book is due out in not too far in the, in the distance, is it? Um, a little over a year. Um, and uh, Edith's title today, Achilles in Green, Reading the Iliad in the 21st Century. Edith, all yours. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jason. A very uh, fulsome and slightly blush inducing. Uh, it's great to see you all, so many friends. Thank you so much for organising this whole event. Um, Jason, I'm very, very honoured, especially it's only very recently started to explore this kind of approach to ancient literature, having been much more interested in humans than what they interact with. Um, now I'm trying to do both together. So this book is coming out with Yale University Press in spring 2024, about 15 or six, I don't know, 16 months from now. Um, it has eight chapters and it's very hard giving papers to, to try and, because as with all these we've discovered today, these are very synthetic and rich topics and it's very hard to disentangle individual arguments from others. Uh, the first chapters on, uh, you know, theoretical, I'm trying to marry uh, basically my customary Marxist approach, which looks at where money is made, how it's made, the mode of production. Uh, I'm trying to marry that up. So the oppression of humans in extractive industries and so on, the industries that do harm to the environment also do harm to humans. The second chapter is going to be the first half of this paper, which is actually the reception of the Iliad so far and why we need to change it. So um, that's the, then chapter three is on the gods and the supernatural. Chapters four, five and six are on uh, loggers, farmers and smiths. So would pastor, 
pasturage basically and uh, smelting and ore in the Iliad. Then the seventh chapter is on the shield and the last is the fight with Scamander and the fight between the waters of Scamander and the fire that Hera makes Hephaestus bring, which was an extremely uh, beloved in the 19th century. Frequent prizes, were, uh, it was often the theme given for important prize competitions in the French academies and so on for paintings. This is one of them, which is going to be the cover, but because he's in green, right? So uh, green greaves, I mean, how cool is that? So uh, that's the book. So I'm giving you little bits of all of it, but I'm particularly focusing on this theme of limitlessness and how that idiom has Homer's Iliad put that in to the uh, whole epic imaginary, as we've seen so particularly clearly in Emily's, where's she gone? Emily's paper today, that, that, that the epic poets started competing with each other for the sheer grandeur of their cosmic uh, visions. So our ability to read the Iliad results from its preservation just long enough to arrive in Italy and then get into print in 1488. This precious printed edition unleashed a flood of translations into Latin and modern languages and inspired painters, dramatists and poets alike. And Homer became central to the Western curriculum and European colonialism ensured that the Iliad made its way across empires on every continent. That curriculum was adopted by Western humanists. John Ruskin stressed that it doesn't really matter whether or not Homer's actually read since all Greek gentlemen were educated under Homer, all Roman gentlemen by Greek literature, all Italian and French and English gentlemen, he missed out German, by Roman literature and by its principles. Homer has long since ceased to belong to the Western world, moreover, but has become a cultural property familiar on every continent. The subterranean impact on our species' global psyche may not be overestimated. In the case of the Iliad, no later author, well, they could never again um, have a, a husband leaving his wife and baby for the last time or a view from the wall, but they could also never make a fresh start when shaping visions of production and consumption of materials. A hero's funeral, a smith at work, animals being sacrificed, workers reaping, trees being chopped down, or a vast ransom of precious metals put on public display. I did think of entitling this paper, How Many Tripods Does Achilles Actually Need? In literary critics' definitions of sublime art, especially epic poetry, massive scale and the evocation of the infinitude of natural resources become aesthetic requirements, largely as a result of the tonal effect of the Iliad, which thereby legitimised, I believe, the activities of every agent of extractive industrialization and colonialism in history. But I argue in this book that's coming out that we, we can actually make it fund, fund, foundational to our struggle to save that planet from disaster by reading it to expose the deepest contradictions underlying the environmental crisis which we humans have created. I think the Iliad is actually a priceless document of the mindset of the early Anthropocene. Canonical, canonical artworks shape the way we see the world and act upon and within it. Our response to the physical world is mediated by our social and literary creation of it. Amitav Ghosh has proposed in The Great Derangement that the generic expectations of the Western novel, in which weighty individual protagonists act autonomously in front of circumcised landscapes and often struggle valiantly with shortage of natural resources, that those novels have scarcely been congenial to evolving a more sustainable attitude to the natural world. And perhaps the violence done to the environment across the Anthropocene has been authorised, if not actually exacerbated, by the celebration of the exploitation of nature by man in the foundational Iliad. Now, until relatively recently, the heroes of the Iliad were celebrated simplistically as supreme exemplars of military valour. Ever since the Renaissance, 
The warriors of this great epic had been held up as ideals of authority. The Achaeans' manly prowess displayed on a foreign field to punish Eastern barbarians' arrogance and cupidity became increasingly valuable in an era celebrating imperialism and manly feats of daring do against international rivals and colonial subjects worldwide. It was the American Civil War that turned the tide on readings of the Iliad, and that was towards offering critiques of its glorification of war and models of masculine her heroism, notably in the 1895 novel The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. And this literary allegory is pioneering in using distorted parallels with the Iliad to satirise the battlefield performance of its protagonist, Henry Fleming, and the total absurdity of war more widely. And during the Boer War, the unfashionable position that criticised British imperialist conduct in South Africa was articulated by the South African Reconciliation Committee, sorry, Conciliation Committee. And one of its main supporters was the Greek scholar Gilbert Murray. He expressed his view in a radical reassessment of the Trojan War, which shocked the public articulated by a notorious production of his translation of Euripides' Trojan Women in 1905 at London Court Theatre. And at the same time in Eastern Europe, Lesya Ukrainka, the Ukrainian national poet, was rethinking the entire Iliad from a feminist perspective, denouncing the ill treatment of women and the working classes by Russian imperialist male militarism in her hugely prescient Ukrainian language, Cassandra, in 1908. And by the time of the First World War, the Iliad was itself invoked in poems by combatants to express their despair at the wholesale slaughter they were witnessing and the battlefield deaths they feared themselves. But the war that made it quite impossible to embrace the Achaean displays of violence in the Iliad with uncomplicated enthusiasm was World War II. And the author who was most instrumental in the sea change was Simone Weil. Now, this political activist, philosopher, and eventual convert to Christian mysticism had been born in 1909 to Jewish parents in Paris. Originally a pacifist, she tried unsuccessfully to fight for the Spanish Republicans. They had to beg her to leave because she was so short-sighted. <laughs> that she kept shooting the wrong side. In 1939, as Germany invaded Poland and passed ever more stringent laws against the Jews, she drew on her excellent knowledge of ancient Greek to reinterpret the Iliad as the poem of force. The true hero, the true subject, the center of the Iliad is force. Force employed by man, force that enslaves man, force before which man's flesh shrinks away. Now I'm in complete agreement with her identification of physical compulsion and violence and their tragic consequences as forming the central subject matter of the epic poem. And one reason why her essay in hindsight seems so significant is that her account of the annihilation of Troy seems almost eerily to have anticipated the genocides and wholesale destructions of entire cities by both conventional and nuclear bombs which when she was writing the humans waging World War II were about to inflict on themselves and the other organisms with which they share planet Earth. But since the onset of the Cold War, a humanist and pacifist reading of the Iliad has absolutely dominated its reception, from Auden's famous poem, The Shield of Achilles, to Tony Harrison's Gaze of the Gorgon, and at Alice Oswald's Memorial. And that humanist pacifist reading has now been supplemented by several feminist retellings. Natalie Haynes' The Thousand Ships, however, finds its sense of tragedy not only in the multiple fatalities, which of course include many, many, many women, but in its evocation reconfigured for our ecological crisis of the ancient tradition recorded in Fragments of Hesiod that Earth had asked Zeus to destroy the human race. Nat Natalie Haynes's Gaia recalls, mankind was just so impossibly heavy. There were so many of them, they showed no signs of halting their endless reproduction. Stop, she wanted to cry out. Please stop, you cannot. 
all fit on the space, place between the oceans. You cannot grow enough food on the land beneath the mountains. You cannot raise enough livestock on the grasses around your cities. You cannot build enough homes on the peaks of your hills. You must stop so I can rest beneath your ever increasing weight. And American poet and classicist Alicia Stellings, about to become the uh, Oxford professor of poetry, who's lived for many years in Greece, has composed a beautiful seven sonnet sequence on the Homeric epics. And the central sonnet draws affecting attention to the brutal, insensitive logging in the Iliad, which is what I first really noticed, especially for the construction of ships. In rhythms that no hand has ever scanned, the timber falls. It's timber when it falls and crashes into silence with its calls of birdsong and its rustling saraband, a library of turning leaves. Its rings, a record of the years, no needle traces, shade the annihilating sun erases torn from the catalogue of living things. It started with the catalogue of ships. Whole forests felled for keels, masts, spars, oars, hulls, made black and waterproof with tar and pitch. The sight of the armada stirred the pulse of men more than the hair, the skin, the lips of beauty queens, of beauty's queen, men later called a bitch. So perhaps, for us anyway, the most important factor in the recent revival of interest in Iliad is a sense we increasingly share of a brutal, wasteful, apocalyptic era which faces the imminent prospect of our entire civilization's extinction. Many of us feel like the herald in Aeschylus's tragedy Agamemnon, who can scarcely believe that he survived both the Trojan War and the hurricane that wrecked the Greek fleet on the return voyage and says that it's only because Zeus does not yet want completely to wipe out the human race. Now, I was inspired to write this book last year by my own young adult children's very deep ecological anxiety and by Christopher Schliepacher's 2020 The Environmental Humanities in the Ancient World. In that book, he argues um, that the deep historical process needs investigating, so we need to go much earlier than a lot of literary environmental studies, because culturally speaking, an Anthropocene existed long before its geological and material effects became apparent. Schleep Harker laments the relative lateness of classical scholarship to eco-criticism, and especially the frequent absence of any ancient Greek or Roman material in anthologies or volumes of collected essays on eco-criticism or environmental humanities. Now, there's a wonderful organisation called the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment, ASLE, which I've just joined, as has Alison Sharrock, who's working on Ovid at uh, Manchester University. And the conference was just fantastic, but we were so much the first classicists ever there. Uh, but never again will there be an anthology by that particular organisation that doesn't have classicists in it. As I was writing, I was delighted to discover Jason Koenig's observation. Uh, I was actually had attention drawn to it by um, a marvellous former PhD student of mine called Matt Shipton, who's written a book on young people in Greek tragedy. He's no longer in academe, who I can say today scale the highest mountain in the Caucasus. He's, he's, he's a mountaineer, so he reads mountain books, and he pointed out to me Jason's sentence that he says, it seems odd that Iliad has not yet had a high profile in the history of eco-critical thinking, or been used more widely as a resource for creative responses to the theme of human environment interaction in the present. I can't tell you the joy I read that with when I was halfway through this book <laughs> that someone else agreed. Koenig's remarkable book focuses on mountains, which in the Iliad, he says, offer a juxtaposition between a claustrophobic, immersive version of human environment interactions and an extravagant, exhilarating celebration of human control. And this makes the mountain images of the poem a powerful imaginative resource against which to measure our own similarly conflicted experience of our relations with the natural world 
we inhabit. Um, I'm not going to talk much about Mount Ida today, but the long section on Mount Ida in the longest chapter is very much informed by Jason's work. But I want to talk really today about the limitless world of the Iliad. Needs a bit of analysis. Now, although they're similar, if shorter scenes in Mesopotamian literature, I think the most horrifying picture of planetary destruction in the entire ancient literary repertoire is to be found in the Greek Iliad. It's formed in the visual imagination suitably enough of the Lord of the Dead, Hades or Aidonius, the one who makes things unseeable. When the gods marshal themselves for war towards the climax of the epic, we're presented with a terrifying picture of a world split in two by an earthquake. And I was writing this bit when the earthquake struck Turkey. Then the father of men and gods thundered terribly on high. From underneath, Poseidon shook the boundless earth and the steep peaks of the mountains. The roots of Ida, with its many fountains, were all shaken and her summits, and the Trojan city, and the ships of the Achaeans. Underneath, Idonius, lord of those below, was terrified. In his terror, he leapt from his throne, and he shouted, fearing that above him, Poseidon, the earth shaker, would cleave the earth and reveal his habitations to mortals and immortals. Dreadful in appearance and slimy, so even the gods abhor them. Hades feels the tremors shaking the very matter out of which the earth above and around him are made. He feels a vertical chasm will split the horizontal surface of the earth to reveal his damp demean. Now, a distinctive feature of Hades' view of the world here is its constituents are boundless. Earth is without limit. And a crucial difference between the 21st century perception of the earth and that of Homer's audience and most generations since is that we now know there are absolutely limits to the earth and all its resources. The notion that we need to acknowledge the terrifying limitedness of natural resources was really popularized at last in 1953 in Fairfield Osborne's book, The Limits of the Earth. And he observed there that the history of Greece and Rome assumes the character of a prologue to modern times. It's impossible to imagine ourselves into a mindset where there were always new lands to conquer, new forests to chop down, and new seams of ore to mine. But we can begin to glimpse what it felt like by examining the idiom of infinitude that informs Hades' view of the limitless earth and numerous other magniloquent Homeric expressions. Timber from the mounts and forests of Ida is repeatedly said to be of unutterable extent, unspeakable, infinite, aspetos, as unspeakable thespesios as the bronze war equipment of the Achaeans when they march forth, its gleam reaching the heavens. The flocks of sheep and goats that Ephidimas had promised as an additional bride prize for his wife before he left for Troy were unutterable, aspeta, in addition to the more prosaic quantity quantity of a hundred cattle he'd already put down as a deposit. The Hellespont is boundless without limits at Peyron, as is the land of Troy that raises its voice to lament Hector. The Trojans march making a clamour like cranes free, fleeing from wintry storms and boundless rain, asthesphaton. Asthes so a false concept of ecological and environmental limitedness is as key to the depiction of the wrath of the Achilles in the Iliad as the never-ending questioning of the exact power relations between man and natural phenomenon, man and God, and God and natural phenomenon. Priam tells Helen he once saw the multitudes of Phrygians encamped along the river Sangarius, now called the Sakaria, in which pollution is currently rising at an alarming rate. Andromache says her father received ransom past counting, apares, for her mother after taking her captive. And that formula occurs nine other times in the Iliad. Agamemnon applies it to the recompense he's prepared to pay Achilles. Chryses brought ransom past counting for his daughter Chryseis. 
Perianda the Hippolychus say their father will offer Ag Agamemnon ransom past counting for their lives. Menestheus' mother was purchased by her husband in exchange for a bride price beyond counting. And another term that often implies an infinite quantity is the adjective myrios, myriad, which in the plural can also mean 10,000, means that Hesiod works on days 252. The opening sentence of the Iliad says that Achilles' wrath would inflict measureless, myriad pains on the Achaeans, but just before the end of the poem, it's prior who laments Troy's myriad countless sorrows. Achilles predicts his death will cause Thetis infinite Mirion grief. Aeneas' fear of Achilles calls him measureless grief. Just a terror of the enemy can be felt infinitely aspiton. The river Scamander intends to conceal Achilles' corpse beneath infinite Mirion shingle. Hector had paid for Andromache with innumerable Miria bride gifts. And Hume, Homer sometimes provides visual images to help his listener envisage the unimaginable, uncountable multitudes. Achilles says he would not accept gifts from Agamemnon, even if they were equivalent to all the wealth of Orchomenos, Orchomenos, sorry, Greeks, Orchomenos, or Egyptian Thebes. In Egyptian Thebes, the houses contain the most treasures. There are 100 gates, through each of which drive out 200 warriors with horses and chariots. Not even gifts as innumerable as grains of sand or dust will ever suffice to reconcile the two. The Trojan forces are as myriad as leaves and flowers in spring. Iris describes as Polites tells Priam the Achaean numbers uh, as those of leaves or grains of sand. Hector addresses his tribes of uncounted allies. The Achaeans' helmets and weaponry glitter as they flow thick and fast from the ships like snowflakes sent by Zeus, fluttering as they're blown along by the north wind. And of course, there's outrageous hyperbole. Nestor recalls slaying Euryathlon, the biggest and strongest man he ever saw, whose huge prostate bulk sprawled over a vast area. Later, he claims, completely implausibly, that in a long ago battle against the Epians, he single-handedly felled 50 chariots and killed the two warriors riding in each of them. A solo display of valor and battlefield slaughter and Aristide of no fewer than a hundred battlefield killings in about four hexameter lines. The Trojan king Erichthonius had 3,000 mares grazing in his pasture lands. And there's a special enormity to the outside world, outside world inhabited by the gods. Hera's chariot has curving bronze wheels with eight spokes, whereas Bronze Age, early Iron Age depictions have four. Athena's helmet has two horns, four golden bosses, and is fitted out with the men at arms of a hundred cities, an image designed to suggest the huge size of both helmet and wearer. Now, it is beyond the capacity, I believe, of the human imagination to visualize a helmet on a scale that can accommodate individual depictions of 100 cities and their attendant soldiers, presumably in multiples of 100. Athena fells Ares, he stretches out across seven plethora. Now a plethron is approximately equivalent to a 100 foot square or a quarter of an acre, uh, more than a football pitch. Ares on the football pitch. The sense of unbelievable scale even enters the poem's acoustics Ares and Poseidon both bellow as loud as nine or 10,000 warriors in battle. But infinity is temporal as well as spatial, quantitative and sensory, and often indicated by adjectives with a prefixed privative alpha, an R with a negativizing sense. And the repeated initial alphas condition the poem's mournful, emotional and acoustic impact. They're also much beloved of all vocalists because you can open your mouth that's why, there's some, that's why Greek tragedy held on to Doric for its lyrics, so they could do as many A's and not E's as possible. Agamemnon's scepter made by Hephaestus is forever imperishable, Arphiton. Helen's griefs are unceasing, as the tales told by old men can be, says Iris in disguise as Polites to Priam. War is unabating, our as can be battle, din, and lamentation. 
the fire that gleams from Darmidi's arms is unwearing. Ah, Kamaton. And that's an ancient Near Eastern motif too. The two Ajaxes, Achilles and the Argives, are all insatiable, our coratory of war. Both divine laughter and human shouting are asbestos, inextinguishable. The pain the Trojans feel when Salpinon dies is unbearable, asketon. A fit of trembling can be boundless or unceasing, asketon. And the sense of infinitude affects and infects everything. Hera rages asperges unceasingly. Achilles believes his wrath against Agamemnon will never, ever end. And Achilles tells his horses he tends to drive the Trojans to ceaseless war. Unlike the Iliad's humans, its immortals, at least the supreme couple, Zeus and Hera, and their favourite messenger in this poem, Iris, do seem aware that there are specific, if extremely remote, limits to the cosmos, at least to Earth and sea, and that a people known as the Ethiopians live far away near the streams of ocean that encircle the world. But other geophysical boundaries are deep beneath the Earth in Tartarus, where neither sun nor wind can ever reach them. They're not knowable by living humans. Zeus tells the furious hero that he's unconcerned about her anger, even if she should go to the deep place where Iapetus and Kronos now reside at the nethermost bounds, the peirata of earth and sea. Hera lies to Aphrodite, saying she's about to travel to the limits, peirata, of the all-nurturing earth, where ocean from whom the gods are sprung and Tethys live, but are endlessly quarrelling. Iris tells the winds she needs to travel via the stream of ocean to the land of the Ethiopians. And we're required to imagine Hera grasping the entire bounteous earth in one hand and the shimmering sea in her other when Hypnos prescribes how she's to take her oath to him. Now, this distinctive idiom of gargantuan scale and unboundedness, Homer's characteristic evocation of dimension beyond measurement, is a constituent of the poem's grandeur imitated by emulators, as we've heard today, and parodists, such as Aristophanes and Lucian, and deeply admired by ancient literary critics. Longinus regarded it as lending the Iliad true sublimity or elevation, and he identifies as totally sublime the ev evocation and deliberate magnification of huge distance between earth and heaven, encompassed by Eris's stature or the length of divine horses' strides. In Longinus' conflation of two passages about Poseidon, whose coming makes forests, mountains, Troy, and the Achaean ships all, sh all quake, the literary critic says that Homer singles out a majesty that surpasses even the Theomachy. Homer himself, says Longinus, is swept away by the whirlwind when he describes Hector raging like Ares, wielder of the spear, like a wildfire amongst the mountains in the thickets of a deep wood. Longinus praises Euripides' intermittent grandeur by quoting a simile from the Iliad in which Achilles is compared with a wounded lion working himself to, up to fight. Both the literary critic and the tragedian were responding to the unforgettable imprint on the poem that Homer's refashioning of the lion has left, whether as threatening marauder or victim of the human hunt. So the Iliad's evocations of scale, infinity, and the chaotic beauty of elemental and feral nature, mainly in the similes, are some of the characteristics that make it speak so loud to our modern age, riven with anxiety about Armageddon. And during Achilles' apocalyptic fight against the river Scamander, Homer introduces a crucial simile that encapsulates the conflicted relationships between man and environment that characterise the entire world of the poem. I think this is the most important simile in the Iliad, and I can almost hardly bear to read it out after all those Libyans died because of badly constructed dams. The great river god behaves like a stream of water whose course a gardener has tried to divert. 21, 258 to 64. It was like when a man 
guides the flow of a stream of water from a murky spring, leading it through his plants and gardens with a mattock in his hands, creating dams in its course. As it flows along, all the pebbles underneath are, are swept along with it and it rolls quickly forward with a gushing sound and it overtakes the man who is guiding it. That was how the streaming wave continuously overtook Achilles, despite his swiftness. For the gods are more powerful than man. Man knows how to interfere in nature to make it serve his ends, dam up its waters into reservoirs. But he cannot predict the full consequences of that interference. For something which the ancient called the gods, we might call dam construction, is more powerful than man. But if the contest of Homer and Hesiod, which is one of my favourite ancient texts, is anything to go by, the, sh the sheer super irrigation of the world depicted in the Iliad and of its poetry are actually what made it so enjoyable. The king presiding over the contest overrules the popular vote, insisting that Hesiod's poetry is more useful. But the audience does not want to reward utility. What the audience like is to be amazed, foul masthenai by Homer's golden verses. They continue to prefer Homer after Hesiod asks Homer how many Achaeans went to Troy. The poet of the Iliad answers by means of an arithmetical problem. That's what the text of the contest tells us. Homer answers by means of an arithmetical problem. This is what he answers. There were 50 fire hearths, and each one 50 spits with 50 roses of meat on them, and thrice 300 Achaeans round one piece of meat. And there's what is almost certainly a Byzantine comment intruding in the text here. It's probably a scolion that's got slipped in. This works out at an incredible quantity. If there are 50 hearths, the spits come out at 2,500. The meat piece is 125,000. So the number of men would be 112,500,000. It's about the population. I don't know, St Andrews. But the poet of the contest knows that improbably enormous quantities just don't spoil the pleasure offered by the Iliad. They are what makes it the poem that everybody loves. And at the climax of the contest, when the audience is already calling out for victory to be awarded to Homer, King Panides, Noel, asks both poets to perform what they regard as their finest passage. Hesiod recites his advice on ploughing, sowing and reaping, works in days 383-92, while Homer quotes from the Battle at the Ships, two passages of the kind that I discuss in very great detail in my chapter on Smiths. He describes a plethora of shields, helmets, plumes, long spears, the glint of bronze, breastplates, more helmets, and even more shields. That's bits of Iliad 13. Now, the internal audience, when they hear this catalogue of glinting bronze armour, are in no doubt whatsoever. Once again, the Greeks were struck with admiration for Homer, praising the way the verses transcended the merely fitting the aesthetic impact of the poem of the Iliad is a result of going far beyond what's actually realistic, required or plausible, and reaching another level of magnificent super erogation altogether. Now, at the Iliad's final emotional climax, after 40 days of conflict, brutality and emotional agony, Priam asks Achilles, for permission for his Trojans to leave the city inside which they're pent up to gather wood from far away on Mount Ida. On his return, he orders the Trojans to collect wood for the dead Hector's pyre. It's to be a great pyre for the best of the Trojans. The men of the city go out to the mountainside. For nine days, they collected immeasurable amounts. Of wood. Becky Bruce is Henry Stead's wife, and she's done most of my drawings for the book. The sheer volume of timber 
that the Iliad assumes was expended on the Trojan War for ships, arms, fortifications, fires, cooking and funerals, because exactly the same passage uh, text is used for the funeral of Patroclus, is absolutely breathtaking. And a mediated aesthetic form is related to the real world deforestation of the Eastern Med in the same historical period. Now, the Greek word immeasurable here, as elsewhere, literally means too great to be spoken of or infinite. And Homer uses it elsewhere of cosmic elements like the sky, the stream of ocean, and the waters of the sea. The early philosopher Empedocles uses it to describe the infinity of time. So Homer's choice of epithet reveals a secret about the worldview of the 8th century BCE when his epics reached their final form. Timber was simply an infinite resource and as such could be assumed in immense quantities to make a statement at a funeral. Timber is not infinite, we know that now. Now, just occasionally, the Iliad seems to imply that trees have a special relationship with humans. In particular, the elm trees planted round Etion's barrow by mountain nymphs, and in the pathos of the very many fascinating similes comparing warriors being killed with felled trees. Now, all except two of these heroes are on the Trojan side. So I think these similes cumulatively evoke a picture of ruthless Achaean loggers hacking down a forest in a land far from home, reminding us that the Iliad, like the Odyssey, was in development while Greek settlers were arriving on the Asiatic seaboard. They needed a constant supply of Anatolian timber. There are occasional nostalgic glimpses of a pastoral life when shepherds tended their animals in the mountains, but forests were ruthlessly destroyed throughout the Bronze and Iron Ages on plains, in valleys, on mountains to wait, make way for cereal crops and pasturing of livestock, let alone war. The Iliad portrays farmers as desperately vulnerable to elemental and meteorological phenomena while celebrating overconsumption in the form of super erogatory quantities of domestic animals, especially cattle, devoured by Achaeans and Trojans alike. Just one sacrifice here, but you know about all those hecatombs. One reason why ancient forests were cleared was to make land available for arable farming and grazing of livestock. As Lucretius puts it, earlier humans used to force the woods daily ever further up the mountain, conceding the lower levels to cultivation. And we can see exactly that happening, especially in the Peloponnese at the time. The type of tree that flourished in particular soil was regarded as an indicator of the crops that could flourish there instead. Trees were cut down with the saws and axes that appear in some Homeric similes and in the account in Odyssey 5, of Odysseus felling 20 tall alders and firs near the shoreline to make his boat to escape from Calypso's island. Loggers used, axe, loggers used axes up to six feet long, saws with dense rows of teeth and guiding ropes to aid felling. Large trees were girdled and left to die slowly before being chopped down. And the roots were customarily removed, they were then burned and their fertilizer produced by their ashes was very highly valued. When Aphrodite is injured by Diomedes, she makes ichor, not blood, because the gods don't eat bread or drink wine, so they're bloodless and called immortals. And one Homeric definition of mortals is that they cultivate plants to eat the fruit of the field, in particular cereal crops. Idomenus says that Ajax, son of Telamon, will yield to no man who is mortal and eats the grain of Demeter and can be torn apart by bronze or great stones. So the mortal human is defined by viticulture, reaping, baking, and vulnerability to death by metal. But in a more heightened ritual phrase, eating the grain of Demeter seems to be a synecdoche for eating anything at all. Lycaon threatened with death by Achilles and supplicating him reminds Achilles of his particularly sacred obligation to spare Lycaon's life because it was at Achilles' table that Lycaon had partaken of the grain of Demeter. And in just one dazzling simile, we're asked to visualize golden haired Demeter herself separating grain from chaff on a windy day at winnowing time. When the Phillies in the North Wind had fathered on 
Erichthonios's mares galloped over the grain-giving land. They would skim the topmost ears of ripe corn without damaging them. Thea, Laosa in the Troad, Lycia, Paeonia, and several other locations are called deep soiled. The Perhaibi come from the land that they work around lovely Titeresus. The sanctuary Demeter is built on fertile land at flowery Pyrrhus. And although the Iliad overlooked the actual hard labour and muscle power that grinding grain demanded, which is acknowledged in the Odyssey twice, where it's done by females marshalled in large teams in Phaeacia and Ithaca, it's ignored in the Iliad, but the stone that Ajax crashes down on Hector was the size of a millstone. Now, the very infrequent evocations of arable farming bring glimpses of intersection between the Iliad and another of the few great surviving archaic Greek hexameter poems, Hesiod's work and days. Demeter at winnowing time is an image reminiscent of Hesiod's advice to set slaves to winnow. Demeter's holy grain on a smooth threshing floor in an airy place. Hardly has Cecilia's instruction of Perseus begun, but the authorial voice stresses the imperative of growing and accumulating sufficient quantities of Demeter's grain to last a year. And Perseus is warned that only agricultural labour will save him from famine. So that hunger, Lemos detests you, revered Demeter of the fine crown loves you, you must fill your barn with food. Hunger is altogether a suitable companion for the idle man. Perseus needs to do work upon work upon work by stripping to plough, sow and reap every single year if he and his family are not to end up begging for food. He's given detailed advice on how to identify suitable trees for felling to make a plough, he needs no fewer than a hundred sections of timber. And that led John Perlin to say that we ought to call Hesiod's epoch, not the age of iron, but the age of wood. Perseus also needs suitable oxen to pull this plough and a phlegmatic middle-aged journeyman to drive it. From his farmstead in that miserable hamlet in the foothills of Mount Helicon, I think Hesiod might well have had reason to challenge the assumption in the Iliad that it was easy for a lone peasant to find and foul infinite timber. The meteorological world conjured in the similes of the Iliad is similarly the actual world of the Hesiodic farmer. The poets of war and of peace shared the same stock of weather formulae. Perseus is to beware of the frosts, and this sounds just like Homer, which come cruelly over the earth when the north wind blows. He blows from across horse breeding Thrace onto the wide sea. He stirs it up, earth and forest howl. He falls on numerous high leaved oaks and bushy pines, lowering to the all nurturing earth in the mountain ravines. Then all the infinite forest roars. And we have a clue to the way in which Hesiod might have heard some of the Iliad's weather similes when he uses almost identical language to Homer's but it's a recommendation to take suitable sartorial precautions against rain. When the frosty season arrives, sew together the skins of firstling goats with an oxide tape to put over your back and provide protection from the rain. Put a shaped felt cap on your head, keep your ears from getting wet. Dawn is cold under the onslaught of the north wind. A dawn, a mist that nurtures wheat is spread over the earth from starry heavens on the fields where men that are blessed labour. The mist is drawn from the ever-flowing rivers and lifted high above the earth by a squall of wind. Sometimes towards evening it turns to rain and sometimes to wind when Thracian Boreas stirs up the thick clouds. Complete your work and get home before he arrives. Never let the dark cloud from heaven soak you through, making your body damp and drenching your clothes. And rather delightfully, this sensible Hesiodic notion the clothing needed to be waterproof, hardly a preoccupation of the Iliad, is shared in the war poem by the goddess Thetis. The clothes she packed for Achilles when he went to war at Windy Ilium included cloaks to keep out the wind. The composers and performers of the Hesiotic poems were familiar with much of the poetry that constitutes the Iliad and vice versa. Hesiod believes that in the age of iron, the age preceding the one he lives in, some Greeks died when they sailed to Troy for Helen's sake. 
Now, he's personally only ever sailed in a ship once, but it was from Eubea to, uh, to Eubea from Aulis, where the Achaeans marshaled their arms forces before the Trojan expedition, as he tells us. And the sudden rare flashes of Hesiodic insight that intrude into the super irrigatory properties of the Iliad, there's about six, offer a clue as to how some of the more skeptical of Homer's earliest listeners may have responded to the idiom of quantitative hyperbole in which most of the poems expressed. Disruption to fixed conceptual and ideological categories is also caused when the effect of the poem's customary idiom of infinitude is punctured by a sudden observation that sounds much more appropriate to Heathsiod's authorial persona. We hear a poetic voice much better suited to a struggling peasant farmer to the one of Homer's wealthy men who sacrifice many hecatombs and pay infinite bride prices and ransoms from their unbelievably enormous flocks and herds. A simile imagines two indigent farmers fighting over a tiny patch of land. A tiny patch of land. Another visualizes a poverty-stricken woman weighing the wool she must spin, spin to earn a week of age for her children. Panderus is really smart. He left his horses at home because he knew fodder would be in short supply. Do we at any other point think about what all those horses in that one small sea ball would eat? Hector is aware that war entails lavish consumption of capital and is afraid that his capital uh, has been uh, much uh, dispersed by having to pay off the allies. And Agamemnon, just once, says that the timber of the ships at Troy has begun to rot irretrievably. Now, Woodland was also cre uh, cleared at an alarming rate. Oh, so yes, here we are. To supply the fires for the vats in which crude oil was smelted and the anvils on which bronze weapons and iron tools were crafted by smiths. But work in the Iliad means exertion on the battlefield. The poem, while reveling in hyperbolic accounts of the consumption, feel, appearance, and sound of fabulous artifacts and bronze weapons, erases all sign of the vast human labor required to get workable bronze, iron, gold, and tin as far as the smithy, both in mines and in transporting it from the mines to furnaces where it was burnt down into the kind of sheets of primary metal that Hephaestus just naturally has to hand in his shop. All gone, all that labour. There are nearly 450 instances of words related to or compounded with bronze in the Iliad. Yes, I did count them. <laughs> no wonder an ancient tradition arose that Homer had himself been blinded by bronze arm and armour when the resurrected Achilles arose at his tomb. That's how Homer was blinded by his own bronze. The poem seems overwhelmingly to celebrate the glare of bronze on the battlefield and the booming and clanging and their deadly consequences. Just once, the poet acknowledges the sight would distress any but the most hard-hearted of witnesses, as the hard labour and extractive practices it would have necessitated must surely distress us today. The poem's apocalyptic visions of elemental cataclysm, especially in the fight with the river, and the erasure of human civilization are a response, I think, to a real sense of precarity and fear of natural catastrophe, catastrophe in the composers of the poem's future. Reading the poem in detail reveals huge anxiety about seismic events, tsunamis, storms, floods, wildfires, plagues, and just once in Book 24, famine that makes a miserable man go on the road. And those were structural to the archaic Greek imagination as are to other ancient Near Eastern texts and are structural once again to our 21st century imagination. But the poets of the Iliad were, were I'm sure, responding more specifically to their awareness drawn from inherited poetry that goes back at least to the 15th and probably 16th centuries and storytelling, as well as material remains of the great Mycenaean palace civilizations that had collapsed in Greece and Crete 
at the end of the Bronze Age. And here I'm delighted to plug when I talk about the fact with the River of Fire, I do a lot about fires, rivers combusting in the modern world. Uh, Eric Klein, who's written the great book on the uh, fall of the Mycenaean world, has done a graphic uh, version of it at uh, uh, 1177 BC with a wonderful artist called Linus Hawkes. It's utterly delightful. It's not quite out, but I do recommend it. If, to give somebody an easy introduction to all the unbelievable controversies about what caused the Bronze Age collapse. It's a beautiful introduction and it's a book for not just kids. Eric is an absolutely fantastic man um, who I met making a TV documentary at his Salonic <laughs> Loco. Um, and he's incredibly brave. His wife just fell down dead and he is in his classroom teaching the Mesopotamians. Um, just give you one sample. So he has him in it, he's in it with Glynis, and he's explaining uh, to uh, the different possible reasons. It's far more about the uh, concatenation of events, both human and natural, brought the late Bronze Age to an end. Climate change, systems collapse, internal rebellion, drought, earthquake, storms, famine, oof. The Iliad contains um, distant memories of everything the Mycenaeans had suffered before their civilization disintegrated. Famine, plague, fire, flood, menacing waves, earthquake, whirlwinds, destruction of the works of man. Its poems, visions of apocalypse, look backward, look forward as expressions of anxieties about potential future catastrophe, but backward to remembered reality. So I'm going to end now on a curiously optimistic note. The trees of Mount Oida have recently pr protected by protesters, at least temporarily, from devastation by the contemporary mining industry. Part of the area was declared to be a national park in 1993, the whole Mount Ida and its surrounds. But the Turkish state subsequently sold land and mining rights for an enormous sum to a Canadian Dutch mining company, Alamos Gold Inc. The proposed mining project is just 20 kilometres from Hisarlik. And in 2017, the Turkish project partner, Dogu Bigger, began felling thousands of trees and removing the entire soil down to the bare rock. 200,000 trees or more were cut down. Cyanides began to be used for gold extraction, putting drinking water supplies at risk. And that's the sort of scene The extent of the tree clearance and destruction of natural environments were picked up by satellites and drones. Images were collected by a Turkish environmental organization and a large protest camp set up in 2019. Operations were successfully stalled and the Turkish government removed Alamos's mining licenses. The company has responded, of course, by registering a claim against the Republic of Turkey with the International Center for Settlement of Investment Dispute, Disputes, in 2021, it was announced that the two of its subsidiaries directly involved, Alamos Gold Holdings Cooperatia, FUA, and Alamos Gold Holdings BV, will file, will file an investment treaty claim against the Republic of Turkey for expropriation and unfair and inequitable treatment, among other things, respect to their Turkish gold mining project. The claim will be filed under the Netherlands-Turkey Bilateral Investment Treaty, and is expected to exceed $1 billion, representing the value of the company's Turkish assets. But that still hasn't gone to arbitration, and I'm very hopeful that sufficient pressure, if I ever send around a petition, would you please sign it? Uh, all will be well. So people's action can work. It has, for the time being, saved some of the last remaining forests of Mount Ida, where the wood is a unique fur, unique to that area, of course, subspecies Equi Troiani, okay, Trojan horse pine. The wood on Mount Ida, including the Trojan fir, regardless of what Homer's heroes say, never has been infinite. So I'm hoping that by accessing the Iliad's ecological unconscious, now more than three millennia old, we can, as humans, enrich our struggle to ensure a better future. 
the Iliad is not only the poem of the Anthropocene, I think it has the potential truly to become the poem for the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thanks, Edith. Fantastic. It's great to hear that. We've got plenty of time now for questions. So, the question, first question I was going to ask was you almost answered at the end in talking about anxiety and famine and all the rest of it. But I was thinking a lot, you, you talked a lot there about the end of the, what happens at the end of the poem and the collection of wood for the funeral pyre. But obviously, one of the passages of the Iliad that has had a lot of attention recently in relation to kind of modern environmental crisis is the opening and the scenes of plague there. Yeah. I even wonder whether there's a kind of implicit connection between the two because you've got particularly the nine, the detail of the nine days of the wood collapsing Absolutely. and nine days Apollo's arrows rain down upon the, the Greek army. And I, yeah, I was just wondering how that passage, I mean, you kind of answered that already, but um, I mean, it, I suppose if we, what, first thing that occurs to me is that if we, if we focus on that as the image of the, the the, the guide, our guiding image for understanding the Iliad's um, environmental engagement, it leaves us with, a, with an image of human vulnerability, which is actually massively misleading. Uh, uh, um, what, sorry, what? Well, it, the dying of the play. Yeah, sure. I mean, because it, I, one man has offended yeah, yeah, one yeah. prince. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. if that's our only image of, of environmental engagement in the Iliad, we're just missing the whole of what oh. later and that. that vast history of exploitation and manipulation of natural resources. So, yes. But, yeah. No, um, the plague's had a lot of interest recently for obvious reasons because of COVID. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of nostology stuff. It's not really, I'm interested in this extractive no, course, yeah. um, stuff. Of course I mention it and it's one of the many reasons they must have known why people died and I believe there have been some archaeological burial discoveries later that are increasingly, uh, and I'm very much an amateur archaeologist, <laughs> I've had to read a vast amount to do this. I have ploughed through German books, you wouldn't believe I have. <laughs> but um, yes, actually, I hadn't thought about it quite like that with the, with, with the, with the nine days. I'm just feel actually sort of appalled, though, you know, how many logs you need to burn a hero. You know, it, 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 it's... Uh, the, the glee and the, the glory that we cut down hectares and hectares and hectares of wood just to burn them once, you know? It, it's, uh, for somebody who loves trees and has been, her lot, you know, I've always tried to plant the trees and, and stuff. It's, it's, it's actually really painful reading that. And that's what we need it to be. Yeah. While appreciating the literary, I mean, we've got to appreciate, not, we've got to not, been flogging ourselves so much as homines sapientes that we forget how to appreciate the aesthetic achievement. And, and that's really, really hard. Uh, thank you for the magnificent talk. Uh, I'm Melinda Banerjee. I work on classical reception in oh, wow. India, and I'm now associated with the staff of the, the centre. Um, what, what you're talking about just reminded me with the destruction of the environment, with this whole uh, uncountable demarification yeah. was of the Mahabharata actually, right. because which which begins with this uh, the Sarpameda Yaga, the sacrifice of killing all snakes, and then there's this huge uh, depiction of the destruction of the forest of Kandava, where every animal is slaughtered. And I was thinking also relatively of the Shadupata Brahmana, which is roughly mid uh, first millennium BC, perhaps 700 BC, uh, where where fire Agni, the god, proceeds by burning through the forest, and that kind of leads the expansion of uh, the, the kind of North Indian peoples through India. And I was wondering, my, you, you mentioned briefly about Mesopotamia, could a broader claim be made that in the late, the, the, the first half of the first millennium BC, the epic emerges, epics like obviously the Iliad, yeah. the Mahabharata, potentially also Fossa epics like the Shatapata Brahmana, has a pan-Eurasian genre to think about this environmental crisis. Because many of these tropes that you mentioned um, I mean, the Mahabharata and the Indian epic tradition also talks about the earth wanting to be relieved of human beings and these wars that are apparently fought the same in order to, um, exactly, that, that the, the gods arrange for the wars because the earth has become overpopulated. It's almost kind of pre-Mount or whatever. Um, so I'm wondering, is, is there something to the form itself as a genre, yeah. that this innumerable quantity, because today when we talk about, I mean, the Georgia Stalis and others about degrowth and limiting ourselves, that limitless expansion, but also the contradiction, so it's Dalek. Yeah. It talks, it celebrates limitlessness, but also it's, it's very aware. Is it a pan-Eurasian genre as well? 
I think it's deeply inherent in this oral origin genre at a very precise moment in sort of mode of production. I thought, I'm sorry, that's where I'm going to go like, on Marx, is that you can't have epic without war, which involves a, a large ethnic group identity. You can't have war without bronze. And this is just not often enough stated. You try having the kind of war that, uh, with bows and arrows and throwing ceramics at each other. You know, it was bronze that made war possible. It was war that made imperialism and colonialism possible. Um, the, the metal tools also made cutting those down those trees to create the wood that would fire the smelting furnaces that would create the bronze. So I think we're talking about, it may well be, you know, that there are certainly, I'm, I've always held that there is an Indo-European epic tradition and we now absolutely know that there's an ancient Near Eastern one, you know. Um, but I think it's about connect, it's also about parallel evolution. This is the genre where we tell the heroic stories of how we went and smashed off other people to make our identity what it is as a group. And we could do that because we've got all this glorious metal and we've cut down the trees to, and we've also got all these cattle or, or, or flocks. So I, 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 I stick to the, that model. However, what you're saying makes me really think what we need because Emily and I have been thinking a lot about epic and deforestation, the, the, the particular is that we need a, to get together with other ancient literatures and oral epics on this. I think that would be absolutely riveting. Yep. Sorry, this is kind of too hard for Please don't apologize. Young lady, you have to learn that your voice is exactly, exactly as legitimate as anybody else. You do not introduce the question with apology. You try to sound like an Etonian. I'd like to take you up on this, okay? Um, try it. I was wondering how in sort of a world where everything is anthropomorphized, trees are yeah. nymphs, and how in a myth that's traditionally started with a consumption, like overconsumption leading to a punishment with the killing of the deer, how that's sort of reconciled with these massive examples of overconsumption. Because at the start of the myth, you've got this image of Agamemnon doing something really shouldn't have and having to murder his daughter. And these myths of nymphs being felled, um, particularly in Greek myth, with I've forgotten his name, but it's one where Demeter sends hunger out and he ends up with himself. Yeah. Um, how that is reconciled with these images of taking down forests to just burn a guy? It's a very good question, indeed. Not at all a question to say sorry for. In the Iliad, there is no mention of Virginia. There is no mention of Agamemnon having offended any kind of sacred grove or sacred animal of Artemis. That is not the spin, whether it was there or not, it was probably there in the psychic epics, but they might be a bit later. This is a particular aesthetic choice has been made not to do that in, the, in this particular poem. Um, but it's an incredibly good question. As these myths start to evolve, all that starts to come in. You get Euripides, Iphigenia and Alice, and things begin to look very different. Um, I don't really know what to add to that, except I think you have, up to a point, got to take each text. And I am somebody who believes that however many bards were involved in the evolution of Homer, and I absolutely think it was over at least 600 years, I am one of those, um, that there was a, at least a group of people who agreed aesthetically on what they were doing that produced the final thing, and they took that out or didn't know about it. Yeah, here first, thanks. Yeah. Um, do you think that the reason that we keep effectively destroying ourselves by the planet is because in an inherent, inherent sense of egoism that is shown through us having to cut down an entire forest to, to burn someone and propagating this, this huge entire war for 10 years that is basically to achieve nothing? But we're still doing that. Is it that because we're just so egotistical that we think that we deserve to, you know, cut things down and mine places? Well, if we're going to go to human psychology, 
I, I do think we're absolutely in tension and equilibrium between cooperation and competition. But I also believe that we can use our reasoning faculties to quell the competition and heighten. And that's what we failed to do. Uh, if we you know, take a long, hard look at it, and that is why I've always been on the far left, because I think it can be done. I genuinely think with a will it can be done. Um, unfortunately, capitalism is a self-replicating beastie and it, it has unbelievable ways of mutating sort of morphogenesis to, to, to keep resilient. And they're also a very great deal you know, of, of the 1% of the human race with huge vested interests in not um, in just extracting stuff. We've also got sort of epochal selfishness now. If you, if you listen to, what's his name, the head of Ryanair, he actually says, I don't care if there aren't any trees in 40 years, I will be dead. He actually says that. Let's just go for it, spend everything, you know, clear out the, uh, the resources. I don't know if that answers your question as to why, but what I do know is that if there were epic poem, which was all about how a really uh, enlightened group of people were so repelled by the display of tripods <laughs> outside Achilles' tent, <laughs> that they went back up the hills of Ida to live in caves and uh, eat berries. Uh, and they sang an epic song about watching the trees regrow down the hills while they had their humble meal. I mean, you do get things like that in myths of Phil and I, but, you know, you get that in later literature. The epic form with this thing. And that's why I wanted to begin with the reception. I mean, if I get you even onto Gladstone and the British Empire and the Iliad, that the, the, it is so recent. The American Civil War is so recent that I genuinely believe that this epic, which is the foundational epic for all the other, not, uh, I'm talking the ones that were in the Mediterranean shoreline, yeah? um, which actually is all completely true because of the Egyptian ones. But anyway, you know what I mean. The ones in Greek and Latin that we classicists are experts in, um, I do absolutely believe they have affected attitudes to resource uh, uh, infinitude. I absolutely believe it, that what the heroic is has been directly affected by that. And I would like to imagine a different kind of hero, um, the whole Iliad, where they epically, uh, I don't know how, I don't know what you do, you could, I'm not an art, a creative artist. Well, I was very happy to discover there was Alicia Stanning's sonnet sequence, which was also complete. She sent it to me because she heard me give an online lecture on this. She sent it to me. So there are, she's a creative artist who's, who's, who's making use of it. And I think that's really important. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that is my political position. And I do know, and I, I have actually outraged mothers I used to in the playground who were going on about how we're all sisterly in the village and is it brilliant how we all look after each other's children. And I'm afraid what's always in my head is if there was only food for two children, you would be killing me right now. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you awful. But, you know, there's a kind of myth that we're all of niceness. What we've got to do is look head on the fact that I would kill to make it sure it was my children who survived. We have to look it head on and make sure there's plenty of food. Yeah? I did, one I, question I, here, and then we've got lots of online questions. We might go to that after. Um, so I was wondering... Um, how you square, particularly from a Marxist perspective, the role of the gods um, in the Iliad uh, in the destruction um, of both the environment and the cities, um, and how that translates in a sort of allegorical way to how we discuss the modern climate crisis. Another in a series of excellent questions. The chapter I found hardest of all was, I've called it meta in brackets physics, right? Um, I can't summarise it today, I just, yeah, but it's an incredibly good question. The fact is that Homeric man is completely confused about what causes natural phenomena. Right? There are some things that everybody agrees on most of the time, <laughs> like an eagle flying in from the right must be Zeus, or a crack of thunder must be Zeus, but we don't actually know what it's saying. Loads of other phenomena might or might not be the gods. 
So a bird sitting on a tree might be Athena, you know, it might just be a heron sitting on a tree. Um, sometimes we just have storms of dust that arise because storms of dust arise. Sometimes we have storms of dust that arise because a god has made it so. There's basically metaphysical bafflement, including from the Trojans who have been so pious and done all their correct sacrifices. Uh, there is, it, it's, that is to do with the mode of production as well. It's man in an unknowable environment. But the sort of arrogant thing, we can control this, getting undermined by just raw natural events, which indeed they did suffer in the late Bronze Age. And you could say that the Morocco earthquake is more like those, right? The Libyan one, though, do you see what I mean? We will always have natural disasters, even if we get the equilibrium of the planet back. You can't stop geological plates from colliding. <laughs> At least we can't think that. But what we've got to sort out is the ones we can prevent. And, that, and I do really find that simile, which is my, you know, I'd written this paper before the Libyan disaster, I'd written the book, and I find that simile the one we can learn from most. But thank you. And in fact, I gave this paper in Athens about a year ago. And one, Tim Whitmarsh was in the audience. And he said, um, Edith, um, you haven't mentioned the gods. <laughs> you see, I was a vicar's daughter. I, I, I don't like gods in the ancient world. I've kept away from gods. I do people, I do barbarians and women, and workers and slaves, right? And I, and I had to go away and spend three months rereading the whole thing, but I've done it. <laughs> yes, William Freeman, um, thank you for your stimulating talk and ask for a point of clarification. How do you define the Anthropocene, and what grounds are there for seeing the Iliad as a piece of testimony from the Anthropocene's beginning? What grounds? Well, that's what I gave them. But, so. Okay, so let's get going on the Anthropocene. We could have a whole conference on defining the Anthropocene. There are scholars, I can have them in the footnotes, who are now pushing it back, not only way beyond the Industrial Revolution, to actually 10,000 BC and Mesopotamia following. If it's the era that man started out on a path from which there was no return, where he was affecting the environment irrecoverably, right? There are many, many different uh, ways of defining that. I'm quite like, because it, the extent of deforestation which you can prove in my particular area of the world, which are in the Iliad, is actually, it's certain part of it, it's a geophysical area which is sort of Peloponnese in, in, the, in the west and actually covers Troy, it's like this. If you take that particular area, we do know archaeologically that, for example, in the Peloponnese, uh, by the end of the 13th century, I mean, there had been lots of forests around the periphery, including Nestor's place. By the end of the 13th century, need for trees meant that the potteries and the smelting smithies were going further and further up the hill, just like uh, Lucretius says. And we can date that, actually, to the era of... This, exactly the same can be shown in Crete, by the way. But we can date that to the era that I think the Iliad in first development. So I'm happy to hang my thing for that part of the world, the Anthropocene's kicking in at the time of the Iliad, so I can call the Iliad the claim of the Anthropocene. Great, yes, okay. Uh, thank you, I thought that was very, very inspiring. So just to kind of, I was wondering a little bit more about the mode of production argument. And so I find it very convincing, but I'm sort of wondering <laughs> how general has changed with the mode of production. And if sort of there's a there's a relationship between the commodification of women and the commodification oh, of nature that we find in the Iliad. Absolutely. And in fact, the uh, standard Marxist reading um, of the Iliad, which is Peter Rose's in his wonderful book, Sons of the Gods, Children of Earth, is wonderful reading of the Iliad, uh, is all about commodity exchange and, and, and women and objects. I'm not denying that one little tiny bit, but my book is not about women in particular. So a form of currency within this patriarchal, aristocratic economy. Um, and it's just quite appalling. And, and that's one of the things that Nat Haynes' book is so good, 
because she deliberately thinks about how it felt to be each of those women. Um, I love it. I'm not denying it for a single second, but um, I'm actually much more interested in the entire erasure of all the work that went on. Absolutely, the women's work is that. We don't have any of the stone grinding. You know, when women work, they're lounging around on hot and cold springs in beautiful clothes in former times, you know, doing a bit of... In fact, laundry is incredibly hard work. One book I'd really love to write is The History of Laundry, which is a miserable, miserable work. And it's always this sexy thing, all the way through to the Coen Brothers movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You know, doing the laundry. Anyway, yes, you're absolutely right. I do not feel that this cannot all be included uh, in this Bronze Age farmer, logger, smelter, it could certainly in empire is not quite the right word. I mean, I, I don't really believe in, you know, the Keynes had an empire exactly, but they're going out in fiction at the exact time when people are going out from mainland Greece and colonising that seaboard um, and they're just cutting down all the trees. And that's what, that's what really brings me back to the Canadian. I mean, can you imagine the Canadians or the Dutch wrecking their best forest on their best mountains to get gold? Of course they export it to a country they don't regard as important. That, 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 that's really painful. The trees of Canada have actually got very big protections <coughs> on them now. So let's go. Who cares about the Turks? And that, ugh. so that's neo liberal neo colonialism. Yeah. Um, so, other than the example of the Trojans, like leaving Troy to go and cut down the trees, are there any other instances in the league where it mentions that the resources of Troy are limited? Or is it sort of the only pieces like a idic source of also microcosm? Because if you think, like, Traditionally and historically, the idea of a siege is that you would just appeal to the enemy's resources. But it, I can't remember it being mentioned in the early very much, but the idea is actually that they're just going to whack it. I read you out the six. <laughs> I read you out the six today. Yeah. That was it. I decided. No, no more. No. I, tell them, I, I do not believe. Uh, Pandarus, really interesting when he says this about that there's not going to be enough food for all the horses. <coughs> so I'm leaving my home. It's just completely. Nothing like anything ever says. We never think even where the horses are. There's no paddock, you know, these <laughs> Irish ships. Uh, you have this unremitting wall of uh, sculptures of the pikes and the wall that the Achaeans are and the wood and the, the spikes that they're doing from the ships and the Achilles that they're not in tents, they're in erected wooden sheds. And then Hector, when he's coming up to the wall, tells the Trojans to light a thousand watchfires in the plain just to terrify the kings. And all the women of Troy to light fires in their houses. And you just say, oh, another whole valley gone. At least I do. It's like every one of those scenes. But we do have these six things, which if you... you know, I like to unpick text by the odd thing that's contradictory. That's bit, but no, and I feel like it's just he's the odd in the audience. Just piping up, you know, right? so he sort of voices just come in. I haven't found any more than I read out today, though. Um, Hector does say that his capital is depleted, in that he's had to, and the implication is that he's had to give things out from his store cupboard with metal objects, but he, which can be exchanged, of course, for food or timber or wood or cattle or whatever you might, or a woman. But nobody ever says we're about to die of hunger in Troy or. And I think actually that the Asiatic man landmass must have felt like that to the Greeks. If you, you know, if you, Turkey is so big and so <coughs> large. Um, I've, I've sailed all around it, and you know, the, the mountains covered with walnut trees. And when you come from stony Greece, um, it, it, it must have felt like this is going on for absolutely ever. If you see what I mean. Yeah. Even Alexander didn't get remotely beyond Northern India. Do you know what I mean? You must, you must genuinely believe it was infinite. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, for a minute to get us to feel like that. So it's only ever more glorious, chop more down, go further and harder. Um, it's like tycoons now who want to go into space, sort of thing, further and further away, instead of investing some money in you know, reducing carbon or something. 
Yeah. I'm getting very thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> I was very moved and surprised um, by, well, not, not surprised, but moved oh. by, um, by your mention of the quote about the gardener yeah. rewriting the DAP. Um, and I think it reminds us the way you connect this to such a, a massive issue as all the deaths caused by the it's staggering. perhaps the, the dams, yes. Um, I think it reminds us of the, the power in the, in, in the almost visionary edge yeah. of the precise quotes in such a massive work as the Iliad. He does that simile on such a miniature scale as, yes. as well, that, which actually makes it, there's this gardener and he's just doing it around his fruit trees, but it completely runs away with him. Yes. But it's in there. It is in there. It is in there before the, the, the fight with Scamander. And I think it's the one bit I would want everybody to think about, that people just don't figure out the unseeable consequences. I was, I was a little girl when the Amber Van disaster happened, which is completely man-made. Uh, this is when, in a Welsh coal mine, the slag heap was not properly maintained or inspected. And then one day, this slag heap rolled right over the primary school and killed every child in, in the mining, mining village. I mean, I remember this vividly. Uh, absolutely avoidable, man-made and, and done on the cheap, you know, it's all about profits and carelessness of human lives, and that does seem to be what's happened in Libya. Okay, any other burning questions at this stage? Well, we're up to 5.45, so let's say thank you to you. I mean, it's great, just great.